placed at each intersection for security and safety purposes. Once we've got that established, we're going to move into the first chapter of this story, and you're going to hear about the origin of Mr. Brooks's rage that day. A violent domestic argument with Erica Patterson, his former girlfriend and the mother of his child. Erica Patterson is going to testify either today or tomorrow, hopefully today. She's going to tell you that in November of 2021, she was staying at the Women's Center, which is a shelter here in Waukesha. And on the day in question, November 21st of 2021, the defendant showed up in Waukesha in his red Ford Escape that she knew he drove, and he argued with her, and he harassed her, and he punched her in the face. And the thing about a swollen eye is it's tough to fake. You're going to hear evidence about how after, uh, well, let me back up. You're going to hear evidence about how the defendant took Erica Patterson all over town that afternoon, from Frame Park, across the river, up Barstow Hill, back down to Frame Park. And at some point after she was struck, after she sustained that injury, Erica called her friends because she needed help and she had no one else to call. One of those friends is Corey Runkle. You're going to hear from Corey on the witness stand in this trial. Corey's going to say that she was Erica's roommate at the Women's Center. She had known Erica for a few weeks and they had grown close. And when she got the call from Erica that Erica needed help, Corey immediately responded to help. And she ended up finding Erica and Daryl Brooks in front of the White Rock School. If we go back, the White Rock School is on White Rock Avenue. It's on near the top right portion of the map. It's just south of Frame Park. And Corey is going to talk about how she, she found Erica and the defendant at this, at this location, and she got into both a physical and a verbal altercation with Mr. Brooks. That altercation is captured on surveillance video, two surveillance videos, actually. You're going to see both of them. You're going to see how the defendant was reacting that day. You're going to see what he looked like, what he was wearing, the red Ford Escape that he was driving. You're going to see how the defendant reacted once Erica's friends showed up and he lost his physical advantage over a woman. Erica and Corey will also testify that at some point during this scuffle, the police were called. And you're going to see a separate video, a squad video, from the responding officer that shows just down the block there was a marked squad car with its lights flashing, marking the entrance to the parade, something that people in front of White Rock School would have seen. So the evidence is going to show that the defendant must have known once things got loud and once there was more than just him and Erica on scene, the police were going to show up. So he took the coward's way out. You're going to see him in the video get into the driver's seat of that red SUV. Corey and Erica will tell you that no one else was in the car. And you're going to see him pull off on White Rock towards Main Street. You're going to hear from law enforcement officers who were positioned along the parade route. The officers who made their initial contact with the defendant, the first ones who tried to stop him. And the first one is Detective Tom Casey, the lead detective in this case. He's sitting at the state's prosecution table right behind me. He's going to tell you that he was working that day as security for the parade. He was working at Maine and White Rock. He's the first law enforcement officer to come into contact with the defendant during this incident, face to face, or I would, I think, better describe it as face to windshield. He tried to stop the defendant, but there's only so much a man can do against an SUV. But he's going to tell you that he got so close, he got such a good look at Daryl Brooks's face that from that witness stand, he'll be able to say to you definitive, definitively, Daryl Brooks, the man in orange on the video screen, is the man who was driving the red SUV in this case. You're going to hear from a few more officers. Uh, Officer Bryce Butcher and Officer Sonia Schneider. They were positioned at the intersection of Main Street and East Avenue just a little bit further southwest uh, in that map. 
you're going to hear them describe how they saw this red SUV approaching. They quickly realized it was not part of the parade. They quickly realized this was a problem. There are people, children, in the street, lining the street. And so they jumped into action. They tried to stop it. As the, barrel, as the SUV started barreling towards them, Officer Butcherin again tried to get in the way. He put himself at risk trying to get in front of the vehicle. Couldn't stop it. Officer Schneider tried to redirect the vehicle up Buckley Street, making a right-hand turn. She'll tell you, and you'll see in the video, there was room. There was space. She couldn't do it. The defendant blew past her. And that's when the screams in the police radio start. You're going to hear from Jim Hawkinson, the battalion chief for the Waukesha Fire Department. He's going to tell you about the massive scope of the emergency response to this tragedy. He was in charge of the fire department that day. He's going to tell you about all of the units that had to respond to the scene. The massive amount of resources needed to triage and treat and transport all the victims. He's going to tell you about the response from other communities in southeast Wisconsin, the mutual aid call that went out, and all the other communities that came to help out. He's going to tell you about how Waukesha Memorial Hospital, just up the hill from the parade route, quickly reached capacity. And so everybody had to be diverted to other medical facilities. We'll transition then into the next chapter of this story, and you're going to hear from some of the people whose lives were forever changed by the defendant's terrible decisions that day. But I'll tell you right now, you're not going to hear from all of them. It wouldn't make sense, it's not necessary. We intend to present the evidence to you in an efficient and streamlined way. We will elicit testimony and introduce exhibits that cover every element of every single criminal charge in this case. But our goal is to avoid duplication of evidence and to avoid undue hardship on the victims and the witnesses who have already suffered so much. So the first witness in this part of the trial that you're going to hear from is Nicole White. She's the very first person, aside from Detective Casey, who was struck by the defendant on that day. She's going to tell you, as we look at this second of the three maps that we're going to repeatedly refer to, that she was marching with her co-workers and friends with uh, Remax. You'll recognize the float, I think, in the videos because just like the commercials for Remax, there's a giant hot air balloon that shoots fire out of the basket, which is pretty cool. And she's going to tell you, she was watch, mar marching with her friends and her co-workers when, without any warning, she was hit from behind and knocked over. You're going to see video of that. 